Okay, last week, if you remember, the Torah portion was what? Noach. Yeah, yeah, Bereshit, Noach. And then today is Lech Lecha, which means what? Go forth. But what's interesting, it's twice Lech Lecha. Uh, and what he's saying is, Abraham, you go, but don't do it necessarily because I'm commanding you to go. Go do it for yourself. Okay, you're going to find, you're going to be very happy if you go. Now, oftentimes, sometimes we don't want to, like, jump off the cliff when God says jump off the cliff, you know, but he says, you'll be glad you do it. Uh, okay. Uh, last week, if you remember, we have Genesis 11:4, And listen to, I want you to get the heartbeat of man versus the heartbeat of Abraham. Here they said, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the sky. And then again, let's make ourselves a name. Let's be scattered abroad on the surface of the whole earth. How many of you know there are people have buildings built with their name on it? Or they have bridges with their name on it? Or they have streets with their name on it? It happens everywhere because people want to have some kind of a legacy. They want to be remembered beyond their lifespan. So here at the Tower of Babel, all the nations or those people that were together left after the flood. They wanted to build a name for themselves. And if you remember, they built it over the dead bodies that they had buried in the plain. That's where the Tower of Babel is built because all of the people that drowned ended up going right down into this area. And our next story is about Abraham. And when we look at this story, his whole concern is building a name for his lost brother. This is why he marries his dead brother's wife. He wants to carry on her name. And then what does he do? He builds an altar to the name of the Lord. So here you have everyone wanting to build a name for themselves, but Abraham is more concerned about carrying on other people's names, carrying on God's name. So let's look at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Uh, well, let me just say this too. Because of Abraham's attitude toward preserving another's name and God's name, what does God tell Abraham? I will make your name great. That's what he says. So the question right now Will we side with Abraham to make God's name great, or are we going to be like those of the Tower of Babel who only wanted to make a name for themselves? Which reminds me of a whole uh, another thing that I think I'll be speaking in a couple of weeks, but I may just bring it up right now just for fun. Go over it again in a couple of weeks. Why do you eat? For nourishment. And why do you want nourishment? To live? And why do you want to live? Well, you know, I got to go to work. I got to make money. I got to do this. I got to do that. Wrong. I'm going to talk about this in a couple weeks, but I'll just remind you. What do angels eat? <laughs> Angel food cake? No. No. That's a good one. But it says they ate manna, which was angels' food. Why do angels need to eat? Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I'm going to develop this a little bit more in a couple of weeks. But here's the thing that we want to think about. The New Testament also says to do everything is under the Lord. When I get up, do I just think, okay, I got to go to work? Or do I think, wow, what do I got to do for God today? Uh, our whole focus has always been, I get up, I go to work, I eat to do this or do that. But oh my goodness, people would have such a higher self-esteem if they realize everything they do, if they do it under the Lord, I'm doing it because I'm here to build the kingdom of God. So what, whatever my job is, if it's sweeping floors, if it's driving a truck, it doesn't matter. You want to be doing it as unto the Lord. Does that make sense? Wow, our whole life becomes completely different 
when ultimately realize and we see I'm not going to work just to feed myself. I'm going to work because I'm building the kingdom of God right here on earth right now. You know what that did to me? That means I better watch what I eat more. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. It's like, oh my goodness, if I'm here, I have to be doing the best of my ability to accomplish what God wants. So it's like, <sighs> I got to control what I eat more. Because I'm not eating for me, I'm eating so I can do the work of the kingdom. This is a whole nother way of looking at life for me. But let's look at what happens in Genesis 12, 1 and 3. It says, the Lord said to Abram, get you out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to land I'm going to show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. And I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is a mistranslation that Danny and I are going to be correcting in the Torah portion, because in English, we have the word curse twice. Okay? I will curse him that curses you. Well, but they're different Hebrew words. Here's what it really says. It says, it says, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse, like you think of a curse, those who esteem you lightly. Whoever despises you, whoever esteems you lightly, they're going to be greatly cursed. Wow. Wow. So they don't have to curse Israel like Balaam tried to do. If they just esteem Israel lightly, say, try to get rid of them as a nation, uh, that, that is heavy. Now, I have on this chart here, if you remember, we have the story of Haran dying. And so Abram takes Sarah and Lot in Terah, his father, they all move up to Haran, which is kind of like in Syria, Lebanon area. And then Nahor marries Milcah, one of the daughters. And they stay over in that area. And it was when it's not, the command wasn't told Abram when he was over here. He is up here. And he says, I want you to leave this area and come down to the promised land. And here we see the Tower of Babel, and everyone is talking about Tower of Babel here. Yay, let's make a sign. We're all here. But what does the Lord uh, have Abraham do? Abraham goes, no, I'm going to build up the name of Hashem. I'm going to build up my brother's name. And that is amazing. Now, also, when God tells him to go to this place and get out of your own nation, he said, go to yourself. In other words, we have the phrase, to your own self be true, right? We have to, you know, don't give fake news to you, all right? Be true. Well, sometimes there's small talk. How I many you know a lot of people are just involved in small talk? How's the weather? You know, how's the kids? Whatever. But if you want to have a deep conversation, a real personal conversation, you have to get away from the crowd. You have to go out in the wilderness, okay? If we want to have time to really talk to someone, you have to get away from the noise pollution. If you want to see the heavens, you got to get away from the light pollution, okay? And location, how many of you know location, location, location? It can make a big difference, uh, the whole atmosphere. Well, God knew Abraham could not experience spirituality in Haran like he could in Israel. When you get to Israel, heaven's a local number, let they say, okay? And so this is why I like so many people to come with me to Israel and literally experience the feel. As a matter of fact, and we're leaving in a few weeks, if all still goes well, um, we're going to go to where the tabernacle literally was for almost 400 years in Shiloh or Shiloh, as it's really pronounced. You'll be standing right where the Holy of Holies was for 400 years. You can see physically, you can feel the presence of God in that place. 
And so in Genesis 12, verse 4 and 5, Abraham went as the Lord had spoken. Lot goes with them. And Abraham was how old? Okay, he's 75 years old when he left Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, that had died, all their substance that they have gained and the persons they have obtained. What does that mean, the persons that they have obtained? That's not slaves, although they worked, they had a job, but that's like the souls he won to Hashem. All of those people who are now believing in the God of Abraham are coming with him. And they go towards the land of Canaan, and they came into the land of Canaan. And in case you didn't know, the very day he entered was Passover. It was on Passover, and I can prove that to you scripturally. But let's go on. Over 2,000 years ago, the Jewish sages had said, that there are three things that they need to go over with their disciples, all right? The first one, he said, was be deliberate in judgment and study the scriptures seriously and diligently, okay? If you're going to have a disciples, you've got to be deliberate in your judgment. You've got to be deliberate in your studying of the scriptures seriously and diligently. Well, Listen to what the New Testament says in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can see, the, back then, that's what they taught. But secondly, they said this. Raise up many disciples. Why? So the teachings wouldn't be lost. This is why the Jews were the first one to start a grade school, a high school. A college. They, they've been trying to educate their kids for thousands of years. Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses commit you to faithful men who will, shall be able to teach others also. All right? Everybody wants kids, grandkids. Well, guess what? That's what I want in the spirit. That's what I want. This is why we want to become more of a teaching. I mean, we are not a milk and cookie, newly saved congregation. You know, we're more like a Bible college because we need people that are going to teach others to teach others to teach others. And I want to be a spiritual great, 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 great grandpa. And then the third thing they say is to make a fence for the Torah. What they mean by that is to protect the commandments by teaching the disciples to avoid behaviors that will lead to sinning. Well, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. So all of these things are basically written in the New Testament. Then we come to Hebrews 11, verse 8 and 9, and it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. So obedience is an aspect of faith. But don't just think law, think faith. Faith produces obedience. In other words, he left the country and he went to the place God was saying. And look at this. He, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive for an inheritance, he went out not knowing where in the world he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. It's interesting. It says in tents. In tents means portable. It tents means temporary. And here he's living in tents his whole life, and he doesn't see the inheritance. Isaac doesn't see the inheritance. Jacob doesn't see the inheritance. And then look at this, Hebrews 11, 7. 18 and 18. By faith, Abraham, when he was what? Tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. 
Okay, now, I want you to grasp what this is really saying. God promised Abraham that his seed would come through Isaac. So when God told Abraham to offer up Isaac, he's saying, God, then you're either a liar or you're going to raise Isaac from the dead. And this is why in Hebrews it goes on to say, because his faith was that he would rise him from the, raise him from the dead. That's why he was willing to do it, because he believed that what God said. Now, Sarah didn't feel the same way. <laughs> she got kind of mad at Abraham. We'll look at that later. Okay. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing in Hebrew, here is the word for test. Okay. Well, guess what? Within the word for test is the word for miracle. And so God is testing Abram, and Abram is looking for a miracle. And when we get tested, like in the Our Father, it's not tempted because it says God tempts no man. But he tests everyone. And it's like if you build a chair, you ought to test it to make sure it's going to work. You sit in it. Or have your neighbor sit in it. <laughs> but uh, either way, we need to see testing when God does test us. He's going to provide a miracle for us to help us pass the test. That's fascinating when we look at that. Now, look at John 8, 39 and 40. Here, the Pharisees say to Yeshua, our father is Abraham. And Yeshua said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what? The works of Abraham. In other words, you would do what Abraham is doing. All right. Well, so the church says we're not supposed to do works. Well, wait a minute. We're supposed to do works. We're supposed to be doing the works of Abraham, which is doing acts of faith, obeying God. And then he says, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. And Abraham didn't do this. Now, here's what's important I want you to catch. God, Yeshua said, that if you were Abraham's children, you would do what? The works of Abraham. Abraham, his kids are going to do the works of Abraham. But look at Matthew 5, 14 and 16 and tell me what the difference is. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle or put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light to everyone in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works of Abraham and do what? Glorify your father in heaven. Well, look what it says in chapter 722. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works. And I will tell them, I never knew you depart from me. You that work iniquity. What is the difference? What do you see is the difference between those two statements? Anybody? Come on, come on. The difference is those that are doing wonderful works that are trying to glorify themselves. He's going to say, I don't know you. Those of you that do the wonderful works of Abraham are doing it to glorify Hashem. It goes right back to the Tower of Babel. They want to build a name for themselves. Abraham wants to build a name. Uh, there's also another verse in the scripture that says, seek uh, another man's wealth. Not seek your own wealth. Seek another man's wealth. This is one thing that I learned early on when I was about 19 years old in the business world. One of the things that helped me always be in management my whole life of different things was because I always tried to make my boss look good. It wasn't about making me look good. It was about making him look good. Because you know why? Every time he gets promoted, guess who he brings with him? And so the whole thing we have to realize, what I said from the very beginning, when we get up in the morning, it's not about you. It's about glorifying him. And if you're building his kingdom, he's going to give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. If you're only trying to build your kingdom, he has too many of those. He doesn't need those. Is this making sense? Oh, yeah. 
That's why the works that we do, it can't be to glorify ourselves. That's going to be the difference between those who are accepted from their wonderful works and those who aren't accepted. It looks like they're just name dropping. Okay, hey, I prophesy in your name, and oh, I did this in your name. But they're using God as a tool to manipulate, to build their own kingdom. So then we see in Genesis 12, 6, and 7, Abram passes through the land to the place of Shechem. Now, Christians say Shechem, which is fine. That's English, so to speak. But the word is Shechem. Unto the plain of Moreh, which also in Hebrew means teacher. Okay? And the Canaanite was there, and the Lord appears to Abram, and he said, to your seed will I give this land. And so that is where Abram built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. Now, this is also fascinating for in the future, when we get to the book of Exodus, we see he built an altar to who? Okay, and what is the Lord's name? The yud heh vav -Hey. But when he appears to Moses in Exodus, he says, Abraham never knew me as the yud heh vav -Hey. Well, no, wait a minute. He said he only knew me as Elohim. He never knew me as yud heh vav -Hey. What's the answer to that? Well, with the, I mean, here, it, literally, it says the yud heh appeared to him. Elohim means God is the king, the judge, the one who uh, promises. But the yud heh vav -Hey is a part of God that is merciful, and you receive the promise. So Abraham knew he was yud heh vav -Hey, but he never experienced him as the yud heh vav -Hey, just like my dad can be a tax accountant. But if he never does my tax accountant, my taxes, I don't know him at a, as a, I know he's a tax accountant, but I never experienced him as a tax accountant. So Abram knew he was the yud heh vav -Hey, but he never got to experience him as the yud heh vav -Hey. You following? Okay. So here I have, the place he appeared was a place called Elon Moray. Now here is Israel, and here is uh, the altar of Mount Ebal, okay, Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Remember the two mountains? And in the middle is, it says Nobulus, but that is Shechem. Okay, so these are two hills, and you have Elon, uh, or you have Mount Ebal to the north, and you have the Har Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing over here. Here's where Jacob's well was. But in the middle, this is Shechem. Now look over there. That is Elon Moray. So this is where Abram built the altar. And many, uh, like a thousand years before it happens, he sees where Israel is going to come and do the blessings and the cursing. He sees that area. Okay, now let's go on for just a minute here. And how old is Abram when God does the promise? 75 years old. Let me see. And I wanted you to see this. There is Mount Moray in the red, around the red circle. Do you see that? Okay. I want to show you this. Way up here is Dan, which is right on the Lebanon-Syrian border. Does everybody see that? One of the things is uh, we can't go this December because of the war, but I've been here several times, and we'll try to go there next October. Do you remember, and I think I have it here. Let me, yeah, let's, uh, let's go back to our notes for a minute. Okay, in Genesis 12, 10 through 12, it talked about how there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was sore in the land. Now, how would you like to be Abram? God says, I'm going to give you this land. And there's a famine. <laughs> uh, can I go where there's food? You know. But he doesn't ask God what he should do. He just goes on his own down to Egypt looking for food. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter Egypt, he said unto Sarah, his wife, behold, now I know that you are gorgeous. And it'll come to pass when the Egyptians are going to see you, they're going to say, this is his wife, and they're going to kill me, but they'll keep you alive. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? 
Abram has all the faith in the world, okay, that this, the promises of God are going to come true, but now he thinks God's going to kill him. And Isaac isn't even born yet. How can he give birth to Isaac if he's not even been born yet? Now, how old is Abraham? How old is this raving beauty Sarah? 65. She's 10 years younger. Okay. Now, in Genesis 13, 18, we find he's left Egypt. He's come back with all kinds of cattle and silver and gold, which is like what happened to Moses when they left Egypt with all kinds of things. And they say what happens to the fathers is what's going to happen to the kids. Okay. <clears throat> and so now, in Genesis 13, 18, Abram moves his tent, and he came and lived by the oaks of Mamre, which are in what city? Hebron. And he built an altar there to the Lord. Now watch chapter 14, 11 through 13. What happened Lot gets captured. It says they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their food went their way, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who lived in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. One who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now, again, it says he lived by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite who was the brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner, and these were allies of Abram. So you have to understand the Amorites controlled Hebron. Everyone catch that. You have to catch that. The Amorites control Hebron. They're allies of Abram. And so Mamre is a person's name. Mamre is the name of an Amorite, and the oaks were called by him. He's building a name for himself, the oaks of Mamre. So the Amorites are the one in charge of Hebron. Now, in Genesis 14, 14 through 7, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants that were born in his own house. Okay, his servants aren't slaves. These are servants that are they're born in his own house, 318, and they pursue them all the way to where? Remember I showed you where Dan was? He's down here in Hebron, which is down way down here. And he pursues them all the way up to Dan. Well, one of the coolest things, and a lot of people don't know what's there, and they miss it when they go to tell Dan. Remember, in Dan is where they also served, uh, make golden calves and wanted everyone when they split Israel into two, Judah and Ephraim. And uh, one of the Israeli leaders decide that they're going to do sacrifices in Bethel and Dan to keep the people from going to Jerusalem. Well, we go and we see that very spot where that happened. But if they go 100 yards and never, no one knows, this is the original gate of Dan. It's an adobe brick that Abraham went through. These are the actual stones Abraham walked on when he went through to cap get Lot back. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. And uh, it's, you, you can't really tell it, but a lot of people say the archway of doors was invented in Rome. No, 2,000 years earlier, they had a dome door. They were building adobe gates with the curved top. But anyway, this is one of my favorite places to go to think we're talking Genesis now. We're not talking 2,000-year-old Roman Empire. We're talking 4,000-year-old Genesis. And we're right there. Okay, now we're looking at Genesis. Well, let me, I'm not sure I'm going to go to this this week, so I'm, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to go to this a little bit later. Do you remember that Abram, Sarah dies. And Abram, she dies in Hebron. Abraham goes to bury her. But what is the name of the people group that is controlling Hebron now? It's the Hittites. 
In other words, at, in Genesis, at the first part, we see it was the Amorites. But when he goes to bury Sarah, the Hittites conquered the Amorites. And so what happens, they get the land for free, and they're charging an exorbitant price to Abram for the land. He's getting ripped off completely. But we'll look at that down the road. Now, here we see, in, uh, it goes on and he says, he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night smote them, pursued them to Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So see, they're going all the way up into Syria. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also when the people and now the king of Sodom goes out to meet him after his return. Remember, this is the people of Sodom that got taken. Here comes the king of Sodom. And it says in Genesis 14, 18. Now, what does Melchizedek mean? King of righteousness. That is a title. That's not his name. And he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. There was always, in one sense, a priesthood. Adam was to be a priest. And it kind of went down through the ages until it gets to Shem. And now this, this is the priesthood if, that when Jacob and Esau was fighting over the birthright, the birthright is where the priesthood goes to. And Esau already had kids. So you would think he would want it to pass it on to his generations, but no, he didn't want it. He despised it. And Isaac, who had no kids, knew how important it was and knew it would go through his descendants, even though we weren't even married yet. And so at a young age, he was fighting for that birthright because that's who the priesthood is going through. And so what do we find? He was the king of Salem. Where is Salem? Jeru Salem. And here's the, it says in Psalm 76 too, in Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place is in Zion or Zion. Now, do you guys remember why or how David came up with the name Jerusalem? If you remember, the city was called Jebus. It was called Salem, and then when people conquered, the first thing you do is change the name. And so it says when David was conquering it, it was called Jebus. Okay, so now David conquers it, and he wants to name it. Do you know what, how he decided what to name it? Anybody know? <clears throat> Here is the answer. If, do you remember when they called God Jehovah Jireh? Or year right? right? So he goes, oh, my goodness, should I call it Salem in honor of Melchizedek? Or Yaira, you know, where it says he is my provider, Abraham, you know, called him Jehovah Yaira. So he says, do I honor Melchizedek or Abram? He goes, I know. All name it both, Yireh Salem, and that's where you get Jerusalem. There's no J's in Hebrew, Yireh Salem, provider of peace, and that's the one town that hasn't experienced peace in several thousand years. But I wanted you to know <clears throat> he's honoring Shem, which is why he wanted to call it Salem. He's honoring Abraham, which is why he wanted to call it Yireh, and he just put it together. Okay, <clears throat> now, Genesis 14, 21, the king of Sodom says to Satan, just give me the persons and you can have all the property. The Hebrew word there really implies souls. See, the king of Sodom, think of Satan. You can have the merchandise. I want the souls. And, or the prisoners. Well, in Genesis 14, 23, Abraham says, look, I'm not going to take a thread, even do a shoelace. I will not take anything that is yours, lest you end up saying that you're the one who made me rich. All I want is what these young soldiers have eaten, the portion of the men which went with me, and here's the three Amorites, let them have 
whatever they want, okay? He didn't want to, he wanted to do everything for God and everyone knows God's the one who blessed him. So now we come to Genesis 15, four through eight. <clears throat> the word of the Lord comes to him and he said, this man will not be your heir, but he will come out of your own body will be your heir. And so the Lord brought him outside and he said, look at the sky, count the stars. Remember all the stars I showed you a few weeks ago? <laughs> and he said, count them. And he said to Abram, so shall your seed be. He believed in the Yude Baba, hey, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of what? Urkaz Deem. He was in the fiery furnace. That's, remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, he was put into the fiery furnace and he survived it. And then Haran was put in the fiery furnace and he didn't survive it. Here is proof that he was also in the fiery furnace. Okay, <clears throat> but now look at this. Abram says, well, how will I know that I will inherit it? So it's like, what? Abraham has the faith to believe God for the children, but whether he'll get the land, he's not sure. Isn't that interesting? Even believers can have doubts. Here, Abraham has the biggest doubt in the world. He says, look, I can believe you as I count the stars and it's accounted as righteousness, my faith to believe in kids. But whether I get this land or not, nah, I don't know, God. So just know that even Abraham had doubts. Okay, he wants reassurances from God. He wants a miracle or something to happen. And so what happens in Genesis 15, 17, and 18, it came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark, a smoking furnace, and there was a burning lamp that passes between the pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your seed, I've given this land from the Nile to the Euphrates. So his land is a whole lot bigger than what Israel is now. But I think it's interesting if God breaks a covenant, I mean, cuts a covenant, he is going to keep his end of the bargain, which means if Abraham's going to see it, he's going to see it in his resurrected body. And it's going to happen right here on a planet near you. Now, looky here. Sarah, in Genesis 16, 1, Sarah, Abram's wife, was barren. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was what? What does Hagar mean? The stranger. Ha is the, Ger is stranger. So her name is the stranger. Now look at this. How old was Abraham when God gave him the promise of kids? 75. Well, now he is 86 <laughs> in Genesis 16, 16. Abram was 86 years old and Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So God had made this promise and 11 years have gone by and Sarah doesn't get pregnant. Well, guess what? 13 more years go by and she's still not pregnant. In Genesis 17, 1 through 4, Abram is now 99 years old. And the Lord appears to him again. And he says, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Walk before me, be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, multiply you exceedingly. And what happens? Abraham breaks his nose. He falls on his face. God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. He's like 100 years old, hasn't had any kids yet. And, and it's like, okay. And so let's look what happens in 5 through 8. God goes on and he says, Neither shall your name anymore be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I created you into, and I will 
make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations out of you. Kings are going to come out of you. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for how long? Everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your seed after you. Notice how many times it says your seed after you. I will give to you and to your seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Wow. The United Nations wants to play God and determine the boundaries of nations. God set the boundaries at the very beginning according to the number of the children of Israel. And so we have to realize who's in charge. Who is in charge? A lot of people like to take authority and they want to be in charge. But it's like, sorry, you're not in charge. And so what do we find in Genesis 17? 9 through 14, God tells, oh, remember, he changes Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, right? What does he do? What happens when he changes their name? What letter is added to their names? The letter He. He gives a He to Abram. He gives a He to Sarah. We have the Yud, He, Vav, He. The two Hays from God's name, he gives to each of them, and they produce life. He transforms them. But wait, there's more. It says here in uh, Genesis 17, 19, 19, 14, God said to Abraham, as for you, you will keep my covenant, you and your seed. After you throughout their generations, and this is my covenant, which you're going to keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every male will be circumcised. He'll be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. It'll be a token of the covenant between me and you. Whoever is eight days old will be circumcised. Every male throughout the generations, he who was born in the house, brought with money from any foreigner who's not of your seed, he who was uh, born in your house, he who was bought with your money, must be circumcised. Must uh, My covenant will be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. The uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in flesh that's what will be cut off from his people because he's broken my covenant. Oh, man, I mean, look at all those stars. How would you like to count all those stars? Okay, here we go. Genesis 17, 15 through 17. God says to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, don't call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. I will bless her and give you a son also of her. I will bless her. She will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And at this, not only does Abraham break his nose, he's cracking up laughing. Abraham falls on his face, and what is he doing? Laughing. Now, here's the word for laughter. It's a cock. Now, watch this. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born born to him that is how old? A hundred years old, it shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear? And so what do we find in Genesis 18, too? What does Sarah do? She also laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, will I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? So, oh my goodness, they are both laughing. And then it says, Abraham called the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him. It's cock. It means laughter. Now, you know what is really funny about this? How old was Abraham? And how old was Sarah? The Kuf is 100. The Tzade is 90. That's why they were laughing, because the hat is life, and they produce life. Only God can take a 100-year-old, a 90-year-old, put it together, produce the hat, which is life. Am Yisrael Chai, the hat, live. And that's why they called him laughter, because that's a 100-year-old and 90-year-old having kids. It's hilarious. But many people don't realize it's all there in the Hebrew. With that said, let's stand. (sighs) Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing in our lives. And how you're increasing our trust in you, our faith in you. May it never end. 
may over these next several years, all of us only increase in faith, increase in trust, increase in love for you, do a mighty work in all of our lives. And Father, I just thank you so much right now for all of those who support your ministry in magnifying the Torah, making it honorable uh, by their donations or tithes. Father, we just uh, encourage you to encourage them that they might also live and live abundantly and not live unto themselves, but they're living to build your kingdom. There's so little time left till it comes, and all of us, we want to put and invest into your kingdom because that's the only one that is eternal. Everything here is going to burn. So, Father, we just thank you so much for all those who give. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Well, I'm really excited, though, is about our guest speaker. Come on up, David Rubin. Yay! Let's give him a big ovation. You got your mic? Are you using a hand mic? Oh, no, that's right. He's not using a mic. Okay. Uh, I just <laughs> wanted uh, everyone to know that David and Ruben, we have known each other for over a decade. Yeah, more. Over a long time. And whenever uh, we go to Israel, we love to go to Shiloh. Most Christians know as Shiloh. He was the former mayor of Shiloh. How many years were you mayor? Uh, a short, a short time. Short, short time. time. Yeah. But many of you know his testimony already because he's been here at El Shaddai many times. But uh, he was attacked with gunfire while he's driving back home and his son got shot in the neck and uh, suffered all kind of trauma. Uh, and he has at in Shiloh, uh, I don't want to steal everything he's going to say, but he can say it a hundred times better than I can. But Shiloh, as you know, is where the tabernacle was for like 369, 368 years, something. 369. 369. Got it right, got it right the first time. Can you imagine? And so we, when we go to Israel, we love to go to Shiloh because you can really feel the presence of God there. But he also has a therapy center for all of the kids that have post-traumatic stress syndrome. And he, has, he does horse therapy, uh, which is exciting. Uh, but he'll tell you a little bit more about it. But everyone, we love to support Silo because he takes care of a lot of the terror victims and uh, situations like that. But uh, we just love having David with us, and he is going to be with us in a few weeks at Silo. Yay! Yeah, well, I'll just say something about that. I'm even going to start with that because I want to remember that. Uh, that when you come to Israel now, and uh, there aren't a lot of tourists coming right now, I have to admit, but when you come to Israel now, there is no more meaningful time to come uh, than right now. Than right now. If you, you have a chance to come to Israel on a tour, and especially a Mark Biltz tour, there's nothing like it. And, and you will never forget it. You'll never forget it. You will come back here feeling like you are floating, that you had an opportunity to stand with the people of Israel in this most critical time in our history. And I'm not exaggerating. This is the most critical time in our history right now. So let's get into the core of what I want to speak about, which is that these past few weeks have been the most face, fateful weeks in Israel's history. So you might wonder why. I, w I would say even stronger. It's the most, these have been the most fateful weeks in Israel's history and America's history. And the two are tied together. So, somebody may ask, well, you know, what, why are you saying that? And, uh, so, I could, I could ask the question, you know, what, what are the factors that have led to this? 
And there are basically three factors that determine and that will determine why these are the most fateful days in Israel and the United States history, and also beyond that, not just the United States and Israel. Okay, so you could ask, well, what are those factors? Now, if I was Kamala Harris, perhaps I would say, there is not a thing that comes to mind. <laughs> but thank God I am not Kamala Harris. And, okay, so here are the three factors. Uh, the first is the change in Israel's leadership. Second, the change in America's leadership. And the third factor is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, now all three of those factors are tied in together. By the end of my presentation, you will understand why. Okay, so let me give you the background about the first factor, which is the change in Israel's leadership. And to really understand about the change in Israel's leadership in these past few weeks or past few months, I know some of you are thinking, well, Netanyahu is still the prime minister, isn't he? Okay, we're going to talk about that. So let me give you the background, okay? The background will take us back. I mean, we could go back biblically to the time uh, that... Uh, the tabernacle stood in Shiloh. We could go back to the time of King David and King Solomon. Okay, we can go back 3,000 years, 2,000 years, and really understand that Israel is the only indigenous party in the land of Israel and in the biblical land of Israel. But, okay, we're not going to get into that. I'm sure that you, you've heard a lot of that from Pastor Mark. But we're going to start from 1967, 19 years after the reestablishment of the State of Israel, all of the Arab nations attack. Israel defends itself with a preemptive strike. And at the end of that war, Israel recaptures the strategic Golan Heights in the north. Israel recaptures Judea, south of Jerusalem, Israel recaptures the area of Samaria, north of Jerusalem. Israel recaptures eastern Jerusalem, where the two temples once stood, and which was the eternal capital of Israel. And Israel recaptures the Gaza Strip in the, in the southwestern part of Israel, along the coast, the most beautiful beaches there, by the way. And Israel recaptures the Sinai Desert. Okay, now all, all of that happens in six days and on the seventh day we rested. Okay, so you have the background for that. Okay, then 1993, jumping ahead. Okay, the Oslo Peace Accords are signed. Signed between Israel and the Arab nations. Well, actually, no, not the Arab nations. Uh, there was a separate agreement with Egypt, separate agreement with Jordan, but it was signed with the Palestinian Authority. Okay, let's be accurate here. All right. Uh, the Oslo Peace Accords implied that there was going to be, there were going to be autonomous areas, but the, the implication was that it would possibly lead to a Palestinian state in the biblical heartland of Israel, in Judea and Samaria and Gaza, if all goes well. Well, it didn't go well because that started the worst waves of terrorism that Israel has ever experienced. In 2001, at the end of 2001, I was driving back from Jerusalem with my three-year-old son in the toddler seat behind me when the car was hit by a massive hail of bullets. And we were just driving in our car, coming from Jerusalem back to Shiloh, where we live, and the car was hit by terrorists who were on the side of the road with AK-47 assault rifles. I saw bullets whizzing right past my eyes. The car went dead. 
I couldn't get it to start, and blood was pouring out of my leg because I had been shot in the leg. Well, I quickly turned around to my son standing behind me, and I, I asked him if he was okay. His eyes were staring straight ahead, wide open. His mouth was wide open. He looked like he was trying to scream or cry, but no sounds were coming out. And I realized that he was in shock, or so I believed. I quickly tried to start the car. The terrorists are still shooting with their AK-47 assault rifles. And I tried to start the car. I turned the ignition, shifted gears. The car wouldn't start. I did everything I could to get it to start. It was not starting. The car was dead. The blood is pouring onto my leg. The terrorists are still, still shooting. And then suddenly the car started. It started as if it had never had a problem starting before. I hit the gas. I drove 110 miles an hour to get away from the terrorists and to get to the next community up the, up the road, which is called Ofra, where I hoped I could get an ambulance. Well, I pull up, there was a paramedic there. Uh, he was actually a gas station attendant, but he came up to me and he said, I'm a paramedic, I know what I'm doing. He ripped off my shirt, he wrapped up my leg to stop the blood flow. He gave me his cell phone, he said, here, call your wife. Uh, I couldn't dial, my hand was shaking too much. He dialed it for me. I told my wife I've been shot in the leg, Hope, hopefully soon they'll be taking me to a um, uh, hospital, and our son is okay, our three-year-old son. And just then, they pulled him out of the car, and they started shouting to the ambulance, he's also been shot, he's been shot in the head. A bullet had gone into his head and through his neck, Missed it, missing his brain stem by one millimeter. So yes, we survived that attack. We both survived. We got to the hospital and we got to safety. And it, it was truly miraculous uh, because, for example, the bullet that, that shot me in my, that, that hit me in my left leg missed my right leg, which enabled me to drive my automatic car to get to that ambulance. Secondly, as I said, the bullet that went into my son's head and through his neck missed his brain stem by one millimeter. Miraculous, truly miraculous. I got a phone call from the car mechanic about five days later as I'm laying in my hospital bed, and the car mechanic asked me, why can't we start that car? <laughs> now I know that the car started uh, after a lot, a lot of tries, me trying, and the car started almost as if on its own, and I, I flew to that ambulance. So, you know, I'll just make a brief confession to you tonight, okay? And it's, uh, you know, this confession is, is something that, uh, you know, I'm not even a Catholic, but, <laughs> but I've been a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for many, many years, but up until that very moment, I still had some of that secular skepticism when it came to miracle stories. I'm not a skeptic any longer because we were just lifted up on God's wings to get us to that ambulance. And I, and I knew after that uh, that God had planted some kind of vision in me. That's all I kept seeing was as, a, as we, in the succeeding weeks, when we saw my son's trauma... You know, everyone focuses after a terror attack on physical wounds, but I, I, I saw trauma, psychological trauma, and my wife and I had no idea what to do with it. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you treat a three-year-old child? And uh, a couple of weeks later, I'm sitting in my living room, I was still home on disability, and uh, my son was still home. He wasn't back to his nursery school yet. And he's sitting there on the other side of the, the living room, and we had this big toy car, and he was sitting in it, and he was, he was playing with these, these two dolls that, uh, that his, his sisters had put in there. And he picked up one of the dolls, and he, from the, the passenger seat, well, actually, no, that was from the, the driver's seat in the car, and he said, and he looked up at me, and he said, this is the Abba, 
Abba meaning father in Hebrew. He said, this is the Abba. He has hole in his leg. Which indeed I did, even after the plastic surgery. And then he picks up the other doll and he says, this little baby, he was shot in the head. And at that moment, tears started to fill up in my eyes. I was totally moved, got very emotional because, number one, it was the first moment that he had expressed anything, and it was several weeks later since the terror attack. And secondly, I understood what that vision was, and the vision that God had planted in my head was to create something, some sort of vehicle that would blend therapy with education for children and to heal the trauma of the terror victim children. Because, you know, I just told you a, a personal story, but it's not our personal story. Thousands of Israeli children, many, many thousands at this point, have been through this. And that's when I decided to start what would eventually become the Shiloh, or Shiloh if you will, Israel Children's Fund. And we have a, we have a website, israelchildren.org. Okay, that's israelchildren.org. And people can go there and they can partner with us and find out more about what we do. So, that was what came out of the Oslo Peace Accords, the worst waves of terrorism that Israel has ever experienced. In the year 2005, the Israeli government, still very misguided, okay, we had a new prime minister at that point named Ariel Sharon, but still very misguided, decided to withdraw from Gaza. Uh, there had been many terror attacks against Israelis, but he decided to withdraw from Gaza. He destroyed many, many, many communities, Jewish communities, Israeli communities in Gaza, enterprise and communities that had built amazing agriculture. It was just brilliant. But being misguided with the old misconception of, of, of how you can make peace with those who want to kill you, he made a big mistake, the worst mistake. And he withdrew all of those communities, destroyed all of those communities, expelled thousands of Jews from their homes. And yes, it was under American pressure. It was under American pressure from previous, uh, from the Bush administration, from Clinton, you know, all, they all put pressure, every administration with the exception of one, but we'll talk about that. Okay, so <clears throat> what happened and what remained in Gaza where those agricultural, amazing agricultural houses were, the greenhouses and all those homes and playgrounds, what remained after Israel withdrew? Well, nothing remained, but the Hamas terrorist organization, the Islamic Jihad terrorist organization, and the Palestinian Authority that had been established by the Fatah terrorist organization under the auspices of the Oslo Accords, they started building rocket launchers on the sites of those old Jewish communities. Those rocket launchers, well, they've been used against Israel since then, to this day. Okay, jumping ahead again, 2006. The Hamas terrorist organization expels the Palestinian Authority, okay, an internal Palestinian struggle. You know, it's not like 
in America, you know, as vociferous as the politics may be, and uh, as polarized as it may be, and uh, yeah, in Israel we have very intense political debates as well. When the, the so-called Palestinians, right, who took their names from the Romans from 2,000 years ago when they expelled the Jews and they named the, the, the land Palestina, uh, so the Palestinians actually aren't Palestinians, but that's a separate <laughs> history lesson. Uh, but the, these Palestinians, the, the, as they like to call themselves, uh, they, when they have internal struggles, they kill each other, literally. Uh, so the Hamas terrorists fought against the Fatah terrorists in Gaza. They expelled them from there. And the, the Palestinian Authority, the respected Palestinian Authority with Mahmoud Abbas, uh, they expelled them from Gaza. So then it became Hamas land, Hamasistan, along with the Islamic Jihad. <clears throat> and from then on, they've been firing rockets at Israel. Okay, jumping ahead a little bit further to October 7th, 2023. Now, in those 10 years up until October 7th, 2023, all of these terrorist organizations were building tunnels underneath Gaza, were building weapons factories, were doing everything that they could in strategic planning and aided by the West and aided by also China and Russia and all those other uh, very positive nations. And they, they used all of those weapons and all of those strategies, and especially the funding from Iran, which is the head of the octopus, all of that was used to plan October 7th. And on October 7th, they surprised Israel with a terrible, terrible attack. The worst pogrom since the Holocaust. The worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust. Over 1,200 Israeli civilians who did not have weapons were massacred on that day. Women raped, elderly people tortured, babies burned alive, and several hundred hostages taken and taken into Gaza, where they've also been tortured, where they've also, also been raped, sexually harassed. All of this happened from October 7th onward. Prime Minister Netanyahu declared war against Hamas in Gaza, against the terrorists, and we've been fighting ever since. That war has extended to Lebanon because Hezbollah, the terrorist organization based in, based in Lebanon, but existing elsewhere as well, they started launching their own rockets towards Israel, which are much more accurate than the Hamas rockets. This has been the situation ever since. Now that brings us up to, oh yes, I, I forgot something of course, Iran. Uh, the, the Iranians, attacked Israel twice, two different days, two different attacks. They've been launching attacks, missiles, periodically since then. And we have reached the point where Israel is going to have to do something about that as well, 
Because if you don't get to the head of the octopus, then you're not going to get to, you're not going to totally defeat the legs of the octopus. Okay, so let's get to the second factor. Why these days are so fateful for our two nations. The change in America's leadership. Now, President Trump, you have to understand, was the one American president, and yes, I, we can go all the way back to Harry Truman <laughs> and see how, how good he was for Israel in many ways and how emotionally tied to Israel he was. Okay, but now we're in the present. Let's talk about President Trump. During his four years as president, he moved the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to its proper place, Israel's capital, where it has, the capital has always been Jerusalem. That was a bold move. He also recognized the strategic Golan Heights from where the, the Syrians used to launch missiles down at the Galilee. He declared that part of Israel as well, Israeli sovereign territory showing his American support for that. He also cut off funding for the UN's UNRWA, their so-called relief agency for so-called Palestinian refugees. I say so-called because there were 30,000 Arab refugees from the land of Israel in 1948's War of Independence, 30,000. Somehow they became three million. And the UN supports all of them. No other people in the history of the world has received such funding, which primarily comes from the United States. President Trump tried to cut that off. He did for a short time. When Biden came in, he restored all of that funding. Many of the Hamas terrorists were based in UNRWA institutions in Gaza and participated in the massacre on October 7th. A law was passed last week in Israel saying that UNRWA is illegal in any Israeli-controlled territory. Of course, the anti-Semitic head of the UN complained about it, and we'll see what the UN will do. But, uh, you know, as we always say, uh, uh, we have an expression in Hebrew that comes from Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, which is um shum, which means the UN is nothing. Okay, it's all words, all words. Okay, so... <clears throat> So those are just some of the good things that President Trump did when he was president in standing with Israel, strengthening the relationship with Israel. And you have to understand, it's not just us at the receiving end. Israel provides enormous intelligence for the United States military and the United States government. So it's a partnership. Now, if you want to get really biblical, so we could talk about the blessings that come to the United States when the United States stands with Israel. Okay, we saw some of those blessings during Trump's administration in the state of the American economy. Uh, now it's true China got in the way with, the, with their uh, coronavirus, uh, but we saw some of those blessings and we saw the reverse blessings during the Biden administration uh, which, which at first seemed to be supporting Israel, uh, but since then has been threatening Israel repeatedly. And I know the Prime Minister can't speak about this that much, uh, but those threats have been very real. The cutoff of ammunition, the refusal to give uh, bunker-busting bombs uh, that would help us to attack Iran. But it's going to happen. Uh, so, so that is a little bit about the American leadership. 
And uh, I just want to say, you know, President Trump is someone who has long had a very strong relationship with Israel, with Jews. Uh, he even gave a donation uh, towards uh, uh, the, the communities in Judea and Samaria many, many years ago. Okay, and I, I, I spoke about some of those relationships in my book, Trump and the Jews. And let me just show you a copy. Okay, this is Trump and the Jews. Okay, for those in our audience here, uh, you should just know that uh, I did not come with copies this time. Uh, but all you have to do is go to davidrubinisrael.com. Okay, David Rubin, Rubin is R-U-B-I-N, davidrubinisrael.com, and you can, you can purchase a copy online of Trump and the Jews. Okay, and then at some point there will be a sequel, probably. Uh, so, okay, now let's get to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jake. Well, actually, we're, we're going to, with the Lord's respect and understanding, I'm going to put that on the side for a moment. And uh, I, I just want to speak a little bit more. Okay, we're going to backtrack a little bit more. I just want to speak a little bit more about the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund uh, because I already told you about how I established it and I haven't told you what it actually uh, is doing in depth. So I'll tell you very quickly, we have <clears throat> a lot of therapy programs for children and while I'm telling you about websites, you can go to israelchildren.org. Okay, just very simple. It's a new simple URL, israelchildren.org. And that talks about what the Sheila Israel Children's Fund does. And so, so I just want you to know that we blend therapy with education. That's, that's our focus. And we have a formal therapy center, we have informal therapeutic projects, we work with small animals, we work with, uh, with, with horses, and all kinds of therapies, so a wide variety of therapies to heal the trauma of terror victim children. Uh, after October 7th, it became more intense, far more intense. We've, we're busy expanding our programs and trying to meet the needs of these children. So, uh, so, so again, that's, that's how you bless Israel. Okay, yes, you can bless Israel politically if you're a politician, if you're a senator, if you're a president, if you're a vice president. But at the grassroots level, that's where change happens. And just as President Trump was re-elected from the grassroots, from the people. It was a, a mass movement of people. And, you know, there were even more American Jews. Now, American Jews are a bit of a complicated issue. Uh, because with the exception of the Orthodox Jewish population in America, which is about uh, maybe 15% of the American Jewish population, with the exception of the Orthodox, who voted heavily, heavily for Trump, like 75%, uh, the other part of the American Jewish community is very disconnected from its heritage. And when you're disconnected from your heritage, and you're not following biblical guidelines, you're going to make all kinds of mistakes. And when, we have to remember, you know, and, uh, and I know I'm reaching more people than just this audience right here. So I just want to say very clearly that <clears throat> the Jewish people are the people who received the Torah on Mount Sinai. Okay, the Ten Commandments don't come from nowhere. 
Okay, they came from God. The Jewish people brought the Ten Commandments to the world. Okay, it was adopted by Christians. But the Jewish people are the people that received the Ten Commandments. You, you, can't, you can't just turn liberalism into Judaism. It's not. Okay, so, uh, so I, I just want to be very clear about that for the American Jews that might be tuning into this, uh, this uh, broadcast. So, anyhow, there was an increase, 32% of American Jews as a whole. Uh, they voted for Trump. And, I don't know, the media is not talking about that, but it is an increase. And it's going to take time, but you should know that the Orthodox Jewish community is by far the fastest growing community in the United States. More than the Hispanic Community. I know they talk about that in the news also, but they don't talk about the Orthodox community where people have five, six, seven, eight, ten children or more per family. Uh, so, yeah, I have only six. <laughs> but, uh, anyhow, let's get to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and where he comes into this. All right, so. In this week's Torah portion, we read about Abraham. Now, Abraham was the one who was told in this week's Torah portion, go to the land of Israel. He was told to go there. Okay, God tells him to go to the land of Israel. But there was someone else who tried to go to the land of Israel before him. That was Abraham's father. His father was named Terach. We read at the end of the previous Torah portion that Terach took his family, including Abraham, including, you know, just loaded them in the car, well, <laughs> on the camels, I suppose, and they they went to the land of Israel. But something happened along the way. They didn't make it to the land of Israel. They stopped in a place called Haran, and they settled there instead. But Abraham, his son, when he grew up, he went to the land of Israel. And he made it to the land of Israel where he proclaimed the basic slogan of the Hebrew nation, which was the belief in the one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that belief has carried us all the way up to the present, through the Ten Commandments, through the receiving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and through where we are today. Now, why did Abraham succeed when Terach failed? Now, we know that Terach was an idol worshiper, and the, you know, the, he's not uh, considered to be one of the great figures of the Bible, but But there's a biblical commentator called the Sforno who talks about this. He says, it was Abraham's commitment. Abraham's commitment, Abraham's faith, that he was determined that he was going to succeed in reaching the land of Israel. It didn't matter what obstacles got in his way. Obviously, Terah hit some obstacles along the way and gave up. There are obstacles along the way in achieving redemption. And in our times as well, there are obstacles along the way. Yes, in the United States of America, there have been obstacles. President Trump was achieving great things and, and some obstacles were hit. 
but he didn't give up. And he went onward to his next, to his next term. And we suffered. People suffered through those Biden years. And thank God we don't have to suffer through four Kamala years. Yes. Now I would like to just tell you that, yes, We've suffered, we've had obstacles in Israel as well. You heard about some of them, I told you about them. But now, we are past that. And we are moving forward. I'd like to show you a short video about the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund. You'll meet my daughter in this video. It's a, several years ago, she spoke in the video, and then the second part of the video is me with the updated version. Okay? So maybe we could get that up. I don't understand what's going on. You just know that something bad is happening. People were coming in the house, walking out. My brothers were watching TV. I peeked and I saw an ambulance and blood on the television and I just walked out. I knew that my father and brother were coming back from Jerusalem and they didn't get home. So it had to be connected to them. I went to school the next day. Everyone was looking at me weirdly and a social worker informed me that my father and brother were in a terrorist attack and that they were hurt. We went to the hospital. I came in and I saw my father lying on a bed and he looked so hurt and in pain. It's not normal for a child to see her father in such a situations. It's the opposite of what normality is. Usually the father is the strong one, the kid is the one that needs help, needs love, needs care. And here it was just it turned over the whole aspect of a family, of a parents and a child. So it like shook the ground and I just couldn't, I just felt there was no stability. I don't have a father that is there to support me. He's just lying in a bed with tubes, can't even walk, which is something so basic. They came home, my father and my brother, and everything just went back to normal. Yes, my brother would wake up at night screaming, and my father would walk over to him with crutches and to try to calm him down, but it just made it worse. Everything was normal in terms of them being home, but there was a lot of operations and recovery going on. But to me, it just felt like I'm accepting reality the way it is, and that's it. I was happy, I was good. I thought it was all behind me, and now we're continuing life the way it is and it's all going to be okay. For four years, actually, it was all was good, but I wasn't aware that I had a lot of trauma. I wasn't reacting in a normal way to things that were okay. For example, my father and mother went out one night, so I was waiting and they didn't come back, and I tried calling their phones. There was no answer. I woke up my sister and we both started crying. My reaction was very exaggerated to the fact that they didn't answer their phones which could make sense, but for me it was like, no, nope, that can't happen, it's too much, it means they're dead, it means they're hurt, it means that the terrorists attacked them. And I would cry myself to sleep every night, thinking of what's death, what's behind the idea of death. During the day I would be with friends, everything's okay, I wouldn't even tell them what's going on. But then at night, in the when it was dark out, it would all come to me, I would go outside, I would be scared to go to my friend because I would think the terrorists are going to jump out of the trees and catch me or or crazy thoughts like not go upstairs because it's dark so first my brother would turn on the light and then I would walk upstairs so I started therapy and it's musical therapy because I sing and I'm very connected to music I couldn't express myself so what she did is she we would write songs together and the ending of the song I would make very positive and I would sing it and record it and then take it home and listen and write. That was very, very helpful for me. All I can say is that I'm very happy that I had that therapy and I feel very sorry and I feel pain for the children that don't have the opportunity to deal with their emotions and to have someone supporting them. I'm David Rubin, Avital's father. In the 20 years that the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund has been doing its important work, we have seen that when one child is affected, when one child is wounded, when one child is traumatized, the whole family is traumatized. 
As a result of this, we've established our whole family therapy program, and thank God we've had a lot of success with it. This is in addition to our other therapeutic programs, such as the horticulture therapy program, the art therapy program, the music therapy program, the small animals therapy program, the horseback riding therapeutic program, the sports therapy program, and the multi-sensory safe room program, and all of the others. Since the massacre on October 7, 2023, most Israelis and many people around the world understand that Israel is in a war for its very survival. And when you are in an existential war, you have to protect and heal those who are most vulnerable. And the most vulnerable are the children. Since the onset of the war, there has been a much greater need for our services. And this has led us to greatly expand our programs and our facilities. I encourage you to generously support our work, the work of the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund at this time, at this critical time for Israel and for the world. Thank you. Amen, amen. We just want to give him a big hand. One of the things that uh, I mentioned to him that he forgot to mention that I think is incredible. Did you know after he got shot, he's in the hospital, and the hospital staff comes up to him and congratulates him. They want to honor him. He's the 1,000th terror victim in that hospital. <laughs> Isn't that right? Did I say anything wrong? Isn't that incredible? Uh, the other thing I want to mention is he has flyers over on that table as you exit out. Be sure to pick up one of uh, those flyers. And then one other thing that uh, is just a newsworthy item that all of a sudden is hitting the news. I don't know if you've been following it, but the Democrats were always upset about the suppression of the vote. And they said there were two million more votes for Biden. Where did those two million votes go? <laughs> hmm. I wonder if they were fraud, because all of a sudden, when you count the number of voters and the Biden administration all of a sudden had two million more voters than voted in the other elections around it, that tells you something is awry. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, appetite for me, one question. One qu Anybody have a question for David? Going? Going. Go, oh, yes. It seems to me that right after we visited your school, when, when she was on her tour. There, that we also then visited a woodworking shop. Is a woodworking shop. Shiloh, is that related at all to what you're doing, or was that a different Okay, should I repeat the question? Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the question was uh, that when uh, she came to our children's center, uh, they, uh, they visited a woodworking shop, and she wanted to know if that was a part of our, our uh, facilities. Uh, actually not, uh, but we, we do have a separate woodworking shop uh, on the campus. Uh, we, we have every, every vehicle that you could possibly have for therapy, all under one figurative roof. There's another question back there. Oh, okay, yeah, it. Jeff. How many of the kids don't have parents because of the terrorism? Uh, there, there, there are a lot of orphans, uh, far more uh, than we would like there to be, uh, obviously. And, uh, and this war has, has created many more. And the communities in the biblical heartland of the country, in Judea and Samaria, and the, from, the, from the religious Zionist population, the, uh, they, we've suffered disproportionately in terms of the, those killed and wounded in the war, as well as in the, in the past and present, those who have been uh, killed and wounded from the terrorism. Uh, unfortunately, that is, uh, that is a very real situation. All right, well, thank you. Let's stand. 
Just wanted to say the ironic benediction over you as God told Moses to tell Aaron. Ivarekaka Adonai, but Ishmareka, Yair Adonai, Panavileka, Vihuneka, Yisa Adonai, Panavileka, Viasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, wonderful name. Eh, yeah, I share. Eh, yeah. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>